Hey everyone, today's guest is Christian Thibodeau. So if you've worked with me directly or possibly you've heard me talk about the neurotyping system that I use and I'm certified in, this is the guy who created it. Christian Thibodeau, if you're in the world of bodybuilding or strength sports, Olympic lifting, You've probably heard of Christian. He's really well known in that space. Um, he gained notability in the online bodybuilding world in the late 1990s. Um, he was a key contributor to the online bodybuilding magazine, Iron Magazine Online or Iron Mag. He's worked with at athletes from dozens of different sports. Um, he's been the head strength coach for the Central Institute for Human Performance. Um, he's competed in several Olympic weightlifting and bodybuilding shows himself. Um, he has been a contributor and senior author for Testosterone Magazine or Teen Nation. So a lot of people know him from his amazing articles on Teen Nation. He's such an incredible writer. Um, he has this gift for being able to take really complex topics and break them down into really easily digestible ways for the for the public. And they're also just fun to read. Um, man, he's been known as a coach who's willing to try different things. Um, and that is absolutely true. Um, he goes around all around the world internationally educating on all sorts of topics, specifically currently this neurotyping system that he does. Um, it's a, a, a system of neurological profiles, personality testing that you can do with your clients that then helps you understand not only their personality, but how different training and nutrition approaches will impact them from a neurochemical standpoint. Um, it's something I've been using for years with my clients. He was actually like my first mentor in the training space. Um, and I have had many, many phone calls digging into neurological geekiness with Christian. He's so great. Um, he has many books. Um, his first one was the black book of training secrets. He has several others. I think, believe his most recent was maximum muscle Bible, which if you're into training, you might have, he co-authored that with Paul Carter, who has also been on the show. Um, and yeah, I mean, Christian is just brilliant. I think you're going to really enjoy hearing some of the, the deeper level of looking into how, why people respond differently to different approaches and training and nutrition. We get all into neurotyping. Um, he gets into uh, what he's learned at the end of the show about this constant striving for having to look better, you know, be better and what, what really matters in life. Um, so yeah, Christian's amazing. If you're not catching us on YouTube, you might want to, if you want to know what we're talking about in the beginning, because he seriously looks like French Canadian Vin Diesel. <laughs> he really does. Um, Christian is great. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Here is Christian Thibodeau. Okay. Before we jump into the show, I've got a special announcement real quick, and it is about my higher retreats. We are finally rolling on this. This is a project that's been in the work for two years for me, and we are finally going. Our first higher retreat is going to be in April in Zion's National Park. I don't know if you've ever been to Zion, but oh man, it's in Southern Utah. It is incredible. Check out my Instagram for pictures if you haven't seen. It is just like one of the most magical places in the world. People come from all over the world to see this place. Um, so we are going to be doing it there April 21st through 24th, 2022. And I wanted to let you guys know, we are still in our early bird pricing right now. Um, we sold a lot of it. We filled more than half the retreat in our pre-sale, but we still have one shared room left. So if you want to come with somebody and save some money, jump on that. Um, I am doing this with Be The Wellness. They are helping me put on this retreat. Be The Wellness is amazing. They are like my dream end goal of all retreats. And they have decided to help other people like me put on retreats. So it's going to be phenomenal. They're award-winning retreat um, hosts. And yeah, it's it's going to be good. So you have to go to their website. It's going to be Be The Wellness. So B-E-E. -E. Make sure you follow them on Instagram, by the way, also. But B-E-E, -E, The Wellness. Be the wellness com slash experiences slash hire. All of the details are there. You have pricing. Um, you can register right there on the website. All of the schedule, all of the people who are coming. We have a shaman coming to do a fire ceremony the first night. We have an amazing yoga, meditation, breath work facilitator. Catherine Dixon, who is like, I don't know what to call her, my like spiritual guide in life. <laughs> um, she is facilitates the work of Byron Katie and she has an episode here on Inside Out Health. I would highly suggest listening to that. She is a life changer. She's going to be facilitating um, two days at the retreat. So I'm so excited to have Catherine coming. She's like my secret weapon. She's amazing. So um, yeah, all the details are on that website. Go check it out. Take advantage of the early bird pricing we have going 
um, for the next uh, week and a half. So that will end on, I guess maybe it's a little less than that by the time you hear this, that ends on August 8th at 8 p.m. So 888, okay? August 8th at 8 p.m. Mountain Time is when the early bird pricing ends. So if you want to get in on that, get in on that now. Um, and yeah, if this is something that's pinging, if you feel like you need a reset, connect to nature, connect with like-minded people, take a look inside at what you got going on and leave with some tools on how to control your stress response and challenge your stressful thoughts and find out what might be going on inside of you that you're just not seeing. This is going to be amazing. We have a sh private chef coming, all gourmet paleo meals. It's going to be incredible. So, um, yeah, check that out. Be the wellness.com slash experiences slash hire. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test. There's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of, exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it, guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Okay. So I want to get straight into the meat and potatoes. Um, <laughs> we're going to dive right into neurotyping with Vin, Vin Diesel. I mean, Christian yeah. Thibodeau. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, Christian. <laughs> we're not that similar when I in my beer girl. <laughs> well, I had never seen the Fast and Furious movies until after I worked with you. And yeah. so when I watch them, I'm like, this is, I'm laughing the whole time. I'm like, this is Christian. This is, not, that, what, what is he doing up there? <laughs> you know, actually, I, I shaved my head the first time after I saw his first movie, Pitch Black. You know, I was somewhat like, I was probably 20 years old or something like that. And I'm in the movie theater with my friends and like, he comes out of this like cryo tube or something. And they all turn to me and say, dude. He looks exactly like you, but without hair. You know, dude, this guy is awesome. So I shaved my head. And like one week later, I got my first girlfriend and I was like 21. Wow. Hey, let that be a lesson to all the bald guys out there. They're all like insecure about it. I'm like, it's actually makes you look kind of cool. Come on now. That's cool. I love that. All right. So neurotyping, can you, where do you want to start with this? I mean, that you, you certify people all over the world on this, you speak on it often. Where do you start with helping someone understand what this neurotyping system that you have is? Well, well first of all, I'm going to tell you what it's not. Uh, because a lot of people have some misconceptions about it. And a lot of criticism that comes yeah. like, to the system comes from people who have no idea what it actually is and what it actually does. Uh, you know, it's not voodoo. It's not, I'm creating this, uh, like, I know the, the blood type diets. Yeah, and, yeah. Kind of bullshit, right? So yeah. some people think you were typing is like that. It's not. It, it's just a, basically, and because it's associated with neurotransmitters, People think that, oh, it's all super complex and sciencey just to look smart. It, what it really is, it's simply a tool to learn about people's motivations, personality, triggers, and stuff like that, right. and how to use that information to interact with them better. Might mm -hmm. it be as uh, if you're a coach 
or if it's a friend or whatever, uh, how do you talk to them? How do you structure your instructions? Uh, some yeah. people will need more feedback, more positive feedback. Some people actually hate feedback uh, or hate positive feedback. Uh, some people need to be like, you need to be their anchor. Some people need you to be their confidence. Some people need you to challenge them. Anyway, so it's, it's to understand how to interact with certain types of people. Yep. And also, you know, when it comes to training, well, what kind of training will work best with that personality type like some people they, they need to feel like they're pushing all out every time whether it's cardio whether it's, it's strength training if they don't feel like they gave everything they've got in them they don't feel satisfied it kills their motivation others well you know what when you push yourself to the limit Uh, form might break down. You might might actually like, feel bad. You might have poor technique. You might uh, have injuries, whatever. And some people don't like that. Some people are about mastery, about control. Yeah. About, so, so that would be right off the bat two completely different training approaches. Totally. Uh, some people love the mind-muscle connection. Some people love uh, feeling the burn of the muscle. It's like very localized sensations. Mm -hmm. Others just care about moving weight from point A to point B and they, and they need to see the weight go up every session or close to it and they need to beat the logbook. They need to be challenged. Yeah. So, so the first application of understanding mm -hmm. someone's personality is what kind of training approach in general. Now, now it's not, I'm going to, okay, you were one A, so this is the program you have to do. It's really about understanding what will drive you. Yeah. Okay, we, we can tell, for example, one A, when I, when I design a lifting program, I, I know it's going to be based around intensity, but maybe they're not after strength. So it might not be intensity in the form of maximum weight. It might be going sets to absolute failure. But with intensity comes a reduction in volume because both are opposite. You cannot have both high intensity or high intensiveness, high RPE, and high volume at the same time, you're going to crash. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. And then we also have the nutrition aspect. To me, the nutritional aspect is probably the one that neurotyping helps the most with. Totally. Because what the system teaches, I mean, to be honest, You don't even need to fully understand the neurotrends that are part of it to apply it. If you just understand the psychological traits of each type, you, it will be a great tool because mm -hmm. it will allow you to interact better with each person, mm -hmm. uh, get the best out of them, which is what a coach is about. I, coaching is not about designing a program. It's about getting the most out yeah. of each client. Uh, and then it will also allow you to have the best program of that person. Now, if you understand the brain chemistry part of it, it allows you to better program nutrition because, okay, and let me start right off the bat. I'm not against the good old calories in versus calories out aspect. When it boils down to it, if you want to build muscle, you need to put in more than you put out. So you need a caloric surplus, of course. Uh, because building muscle is not just about protein. It's not a matter. Of, I'm going to eat 400 grams of protein, but only 1200 calories. So I'm going to build muscle and get lean. That doesn't work like that. Building muscle requires energy and tons of it. To build a muscle, it's probably around 5,000 calories just to fuel the growth process. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you need a surplus. And to lose weight or to lose fat, you need a deficit, either through caloric restriction or an increase in exercise volume. Uh, however, that's not the only thing that matters. Mostly because, well, you know what? If you feel like shit when you're on a diet, you're not going to stick to it. All right. okay, you're going to get cravings, you're going to get moody, and you're going to say at one point, you know what? Screw this. I mean, right. why have habs if my life sucks? Right. If I don't enjoy any part of it? If I feel like I'm a slave to my diet? And more often than not, that actually comes from the fact that the nutrients ratios you have, the micro and macronutrients yeah. will affect your brain chemistry, your neurotransmitter balance, which is highly affected by which nutrients you ingest, which stress level and stuff like that. And if you get out of balance too much, 
for example, best example, if your glutamate gets too high and GABA gets down, you just you get moody as hell. You take everything personal. You have no patience. You can't sleep properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything gets to you. So it's, and you're going to get huge cravings. Yeah. So it's not a good place to be in over the long run, right? Yeah. And some people will get greatly affected when it comes to glutamate and GABA and dieting. Serotonin will affect other people. So when you understand that, okay, if I'm eating this and I'm cutting that out over the mid and maybe long run, this is how it will affect my brain chemistry. And if it affects my brain chemistry too much, Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to feel good. Right. I might get depressed. I, I'm not going to be able to sleep properly. Um, you know, every time in my life, when I got into like a really great shape, I was a larva. Like the, the, the uh, okay, the, I, I just did a photo shoot a few weeks ago and I had to use an extreme approach. I'm going to get back to the neurotyping system, but you know how I work, right? It's always yeah, yeah, like yeah. back and forth. So, so I had to use an extreme approach because my wife gave me six weeks because she know how I get when I, when I get, when I diet, even when I'm not extreme, because yeah. it, when I want to prepare for a photo shoot or a, a, a lifting contest or whatever, or a specific goal, my life become that goals. And subconsciously, well, everything starts to matter less and less. Right. And I become a really unidimensional human being, which sucks. Okay. Yeah. So she gave me six weeks, which is actually very generous of her. And the point, the problem is that I was 231 pounds when I started out. My normal body weight, like in really good shape, is about 195, 200. Uh, and when I'm in normal condition, like presentable, let's say 215-ish. Uh, but I, I, ju- I was just coming out of uh, a six month, a six weeks month, uh, phase of I want to get my squad back up to 500 Mm. and to do that well I invented several meals during my day like a cake meal uh, a (laughs) burger meal so so I went up to 231 so I had a lot of extra fat to lose and and I just had to use an extreme approach and the first two weeks I actually felt pretty darn good probably because all the sugar I was eating like left me moody and stuff like that and cutting that out made me feel better for a while right Mm -hmm. Uh, it probably decreased my glutamate because when blood right. sugar is high, your glutamate goes up. So it, it, it was pretty good. I mean, I, I was actually pretty good. Dude, I might pull this off. Mm-hmm. I might actually diet and feel good throughout. Well, when the third week came, dude, I, I became like the laziest, moodiest, most intolerable human being you've ever seen. And, in, I, and by week four, I had this inner violence in me that I didn't suspect existed. Like I can honestly tell you that I know how serial killers feel, okay? Wow. Dude, I, I was, and I, it's a good thing that I can restrain myself because several yeah. times I, I really felt about like kicking my dog. I love dogs. Wow. Every time someone would just walk by, I, I just wanted to beat the crap out of them. Wow. And the reason for that is my calories were so low, my carbs were so low, my activity level was so high, cortisol was through the roof 24-7. Wow. Now, what people need to understand, and that's the first connection with neurotyping, right, mm-hmm. is that cortisol and adrenaline are connected. In fact, cortisol increases the level of adrenaline. When cortisol goes up, Adrenaline goes up. And what does adrenaline do? It gets you competitive. It gets you aggressive, impatient. Com- so, so basically, if you have too much of it, you can actually become an asshole because yeah. you need to win everything. You be- but it puts you in fight or flight mode. Right, right. The fight mode was the one that was emphasized for me. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the problem is that my neurotype, okay, I'm a 2A, extremely sensitive to adrenaline. So yeah. having that extra adrenaline, totally, it, it just may it's turn me the into roof. a monster. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I know how much you love your dog. So it's like crazy oh. to hear you were in that state. And this, this leads me to this cortisol and adrenaline. I want to hang here for a second, because yeah. I'd say for me as a coach, 
using neurotyping, that connection right there, especially I I'll just say with women and our, our type threes, which we can go into in a minute, but I see this, uh, we're literally testing their blood sugar and have continuous glucose monitors. And I can see they're in this chronic high cortisol state, their adrenaline goes up. Now they can't lose weight. So if you're stuck in this, like my blood sugar is really high. I'm super freaking moody. I'm super stressed out all the time. This is something that you might want to dive into. Cause for me, like what, what I've really learned is that the root of it is a lack of emotional processing combined with a bad nutrition approach, which is basically starve myself and over exercise. Cause these types are dr driven towards that a, a high adrenaline state anyway. Right. And that's when we get this adrenal dysfunction and really like the work that I've done with you has helped me so much with those clients, because a lot of them are coming to me from keto right? So here they are there and they're like not staying on top of hydration. So they're getting like basically in this high cortisol, high adrenal place all the time. And now, now, you know, we can get dive into the neurotypes in a minute, but this connection, like understanding how the way you're eating combined with a lack of emotional processing, in my opinion, it, it puts you in this state where you're like doomed, you know, and you don't even recognize how much it's impacting your personality mm -hmm. and how you could be different if you made some tweaks to that. So anyway, we can, yeah, we can come back to and your that's point. Absolutely but. Correct. And the problem and the other problem is that in the short term, being in that state actually makes you feel good and mm -hmm. lose weight. Yeah. Because cortisol and adrenaline are actually fat mobilization hormones. Right. They are right. also energy promoting hormones and neurotransmitters. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the first time when you get that, that boost, right. you feel super energetic. Like when you go intermittent yeah. fasting or, or keto for the first time, super high energy. And you can't figure it out because you're eating less, especially with intermittent fasting. The reason why you have high energy on keto and especially intermittent fasting is because of the high adrenaline. Because one of the things that will trigger cortisol, of course, besides stress, is the need to mobilize stored energy. Cortisol's main function, and in every single seminar I give, I always give a 45-minute presentation on cortisol. It's funny because people who've, who've been to like five of my, of my seminars or webinars, they've all heard it five times and they take new notes every time. It is the most important thing to understand as a coach. Uh, now, now, cortisol's function is to make sure that wh whatever the stress you are facing could be a tiger that you need to run away from or fight with. It could be a lack of food that you need to survive. Well, cortisol makes sure that you will be in the optimal physiological state to face that danger. Right. So it will amp you up yeah. by increasing adrenaline. So you can yeah. fight that tiger. You can run away from the tiger or you can have more motivation to find food, right? It will also mobilize stored energy. Now, we, uh, people who train, they think of cortisol as this hormone that breaks down muscle tissue. Well, you know, it, there is no such thing as an auto-destruct hormone <laughs> in your body, right? The yeah. role of cortisol is not to break down muscle tissue. That's a side effect. It's yeah. to mobilize stored energy if you mm. need energy because you're not getting enough energy yeah. and muscle tissue can be turned into glucose by the liver. Right, right. So when you go on a low carbs diet, especially with a caloric restriction, cortisol is through the roof because it's used to mobilize stored energy. And it's actually, a, a, cortisol is actually a, a, a fat loss hormone. Yeah. So at first, when you at get first. that high stress okay. response, I adrenal state, you yeah. will lose fat. You will also lose water. Okay. Yeah. The problem becomes because Charles Pollock mentioned that when you have more fat around your belly, you, it's because yeah. you have too much cortisol. Uh, I'm more or less in agreement with that. But the fact is that if cortisol becomes chronically elevated, yes. right. it does become a fat promoting hormone. Right. Because the, the blood sugar is so high <laughs> all yeah, the well, time. Yeah. Because the reason is that cortisol several reasons why it, why it will impact fat loss. The first one is that excess cortisol will trigger a mechanism called metabolic adaptation. It, and the main metabolic adaptation triggered by cortisol will be a decrease in the conversion of the T4 thyroid hormone mm -hmm. into the T3 thyroid mm -hmm. hormone, which mm -hmm. is the metabolically active one. T3 right. is the one that increases metabolic rate, that you burn more calories. Right. Okay? The body does not produce that much T3 directly. It converts T4 that it produces in greater yeah. amounts. Yeah. And the cortisol actually stops that conversion. And it's a survival mechanism. 
because the only time when we were evolving, okay, the only time when cortisol was chronically elevated was when we were deprived of food. Because if you're fighting a tiger, yes, you get a rush in cortisol, but you either kill the tiger and a few mm -hmm. minutes later, cortisol comes back down because the stress is gone or the tiger mm -hmm. kills you in that case, well, cortisol <laughs> also goes down for a different reason. <laughs> but, but if you can't find food, for several days, the body stays in that mode where cortisol needs to be high to constantly mobilize stored energy. And when that happens, the body, one adaptation that came with it was stopping the conversion of T4 to T3 to decrease metabolic rate. Right, right. So, so it's not so much that cortisol makes you store fat. It's that once excess cortisol is elevated for long enough for that T3 conversion yeah. to decrease, metabolic rate comes down. So right. for example, if you were eating 1800 calories and that was a 200 calorie uh, deficit, but now your metabolic rate decreases by 400. It's now a 200 calories surplus. So mm. And fat loss stops, see what I mean? Mm. So that's yeah. the first mechanism. Second mechanism is chronically elevated cortisol levels will lead to insulin resistance. Yeah. Because what it does, cortisol mobilizes stored energy. When blood sugar comes down, you have glucagon and cortisol working together to mobilize stored glucose, glycogen, to bring blood sugar back down to normal level. And if you don't have enough glycogen stored, it will break down muscle tissue, turn it into glucose to bring blood sugar back up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why you, yeah. when the low carb is dieting, you get more cortisol because you need to maintain that. Now, if you are a caveman fighting a tiger, cortisol goes up, blood sugar goes up. Not a problem. I'm using it to fight said tiger. That's mm -hmm. fine. But mm -hmm. if I'm Bob the accountant, <laughs> yeah. I just ate five donuts. Blood sugar is through the roof already. My boss comes in, gives me yeah. a new task, and I'm late already. Yeah. Boom, stress goes through the roof. But you know what? You cannot dissociate a hormone from its function. So if cortisol goes up, blood sugar goes up. It was yeah. already high. Yeah. Okay? Now, if cortisol is chronically elevated, you will chronically elevate blood sugar. What right. do you need to do when blood sugar level is high? You release insulin to bring it back down. Yep. If you constantly pump out insulin... Right you become resistant to it. Yep. I know that it's popular nowadays to say that oh, insulin, insulin doesn't make you fat. No, in, okay. cortisol doesn't make you fat. Insulin right. doesn't make you fat. <laughs> insulin doesn't store nutrients that you don't eat, okay? If you eat a deficit, even if your insulin is yeah. high, you're still gonna lose some weight, okay? Yeah. However, insulin resistance or insulin mm -hmm. can make it harder to lose fat. For sure. The reason, the reason is that it's a storage hormone. Its function is to take the nutrients available in your body and store them. By extension, it reduces mobilization of energy. You know, insulin is mm -hmm. anti-catabolic because right. it prevents the breakdown of muscle tissue, but it's right. also anti-catabolic to muscle glycogen. So, so, and even body fat. Hmm. So as yeah. long as insulin is elevated significant, significantly above baseline, it becomes much harder to mobilize stored energy, including fat. It's not impossible, okay? It's just less efficient, okay? Yeah. Now, if you are insulin resistant, what does that mean? It means that if you are resistant to insulin, your cells do not respond well to insulin. So you need more insulin to get the job done. So if I'm mm -hmm. eating a meal, if normally my body would produce five IUs of insulin to get the job done, maybe it needs to, re to release 15. Mm -hmm. The problem is if I'm releasing more insulin, it takes a lot longer to come back down. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's elevated, I'm inefficient at mobilizing fat for fuel. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't store more fat. It makes it a bit more complicated to lose fat. Okay, so, I, I love this for, especially for my ketogenic side of my audience, because I remember in, and by the way, Christian did a keto experiment and we can talk about that possibly, but I, I remember on one of our calls, you saying, 
oh, I don't think people are high on ketones. I think they're high on adrenaline. And it really got me thinking. And I, and you know, I look at the ketogenic community and I've seen this pattern over and over and over. It's why I, I wrote a book about it. Actually, Christian, it's coming out at the end of this year. It's called short-term keto, but, um, I seen this pattern of, wow, these cool metabolic adaptations occur. I lose a bunch of weight. I'm super high. I feel like a superhuman. I'm good. Like going, 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 everything is awesome. And then if they stay keto long-term, I see weight gain. I see chronic stress. I see, they seem almost a little bit like out of their minds a little bit after, sorry, people, I'm just saying I've seen this. It's this super hyper. I've been in adrenaline fight or flight mode for a long time. And then we pair this with intermittent fasting and like most of the time now it's Jeff Volick and Stephen Finney did find that if, if you have adequate salt intake, it can help prevent some of the rise of that adrenaline. But how many people are really on top of it? It's like, do you have a gauge in your body knowing if your sodium no. levels are okay all the time? Don't and then forget uh, that, don't forget that a keto diet is normally low on potassium. So if you yeah. just have tons of salt to your stuff, you would create a, an, uh, electric- an imbalance. For sure. And then on top of it, what do people do? They, they crank the coffee all day. They're trying to fast. Now they're like reducing their electrolytes with the diuretic effect of the coffee. Plus they're putting themselves in this high adrenaline cortisol mode all the time, diet sodas, energy drinks, cause there's no calories, there's no carbs. And I see this like detriment going. And what do I see long-term? A lot of time I see weight gain. I see exactly what you just illustrated is this like, Ooh, I lost a lot of weight and I feel amazing. And then we start the weight starts coming back. And I think that is a huge part of it is what you just described. So thank you for that. There are some other aspects. And by the way, what you mentioned, what can actually also happen. And that's what happened to me because, because I had to become, I only had six weeks. I went really, really hardcore. It wasn't a keto diet. It was basically an all protein diet, but the yeah. effect is the same, right? The effect is the same. I had some yeah. problems around the workout, but the effect is the same that adrenaline goes super high. And that's why I remember I had my, uh, my, my, my cardio was carrying uh, around a 50 pound sandbag around the neighborhood. Right. And I had my music on and dude, I was after 45 minutes, I was dancing in the street. I felt mm-hmm. like I was on speed. It was crazy. Wow. And I don't, I don't really dance. So I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to. So you're I, like, that was definitely, I was on uh, drugs. <laughs> yeah, and then I was high. I was high for several hours afterwards. Mm. By week four, I crashed. Why? Why is that? Because if you produce too much adrenaline, just like if you produce too much insulin, your receptors become resistant to it. The two yeah. receptors that are the most easily downregulated are the insulin receptors and the adrenaline receptors or, or the adrenergic receptors, the beta adrenergic receptors. The reason is that in both cases, being too sensitive can act and being overstimulated can lead to death. Because if, for example, if uh, my uh, insulin system is too effective, then I go into hypoglycemia, I can, I can go in a coma. If my mm-hmm. adrenergic right system is to activate it, I can go into cardiac arrest because my heart yeah. just can't keep right. up. So, so there's a, a protective mechanism built in that mm-hmm. if these receptors are overstimulated, even in the short term, they can become downregulated really, really fast. Dr. Fry did a study in 2015. They used excessive training, like Bulgarian type training, maxing out five mm-hmm. days a week. And mm-hmm. what they found was that in as little as two weeks, there was up to a 40% decrease in the sensitivity of the adrenergic receptors. Doesn't wow. take long for the adrenaline receptors to become downregulated. Wow. And that's what happened. Yeah, and they were not even dieting. So take wow. me, for example, I was doing abs in the morning. I was walking with my son afterwards, one hour with the, with the cradle. Then I, I was doing my training. Then I was doing my sandbag carry and walking the dogs. And on top of that, basically almost zero carbs. So my <laughs> adrenaline was here. Totally. That's why after three weeks, my receptors basically stopped responding to adrenaline. Wow. That's why I was so lazy and just couldn't get motivated to train or anything because right. now I can't respond to the, neuro, the neurotransmitter that amps my, myself up. Muscle tone went down, strength went down, energy went down. So that's the first yeah. thing. And, and we can see that with intermittent fasting and keto dieting, especially if you take stimulants or coffee, uh, like you mentioned. Now, and the, the other adaptation that come, can, can happen, and we've seen that mostly when I work with, with physique athletes or bodybuilders on a low-carbs diet, 
is that you can actually develop peripheral insulin resistance. Now, low carbs dieting, normally at first, it improves insulin sensitivity. But if you maintain it over the long run, your muscles actually become insulin resistant. Okay, I noticed that years ago when I was using mostly low carbs and keto dieting with bodybuilders, because keto is nothing new. I mean, I was using it in, in 1990 with the Body Opus diet with, by Dan Duchesne or the anabolic diet by yeah. Mo Pasquale, or then Lyle McDonald with the ketogenic diet. Yeah. And I was using that and I was using it with, with, with the bodybuilders I was training. And what I noticed is that if we stayed low carbs for the whole prep, we just couldn't carb load when it came to the competition, it was impossible. We could not use carbs to fill out for the competition. I couldn't understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen some studies recently that if you are very low carbs for a long period of time, you develop muscle peripheral insulin resistance. And the reason, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adaptation for survival because what the body wants to avoid at all costs is becoming hypoglycemic. And it also wants to save the, every little bit of glucose you have available for your brain, your heart function, okay? Mm -hmm. So to do that, to ensure that you don't get into hypoglycemia too easily and, you can, and that the little carbs you have will be used for something else, it actually makes the muscle, muscles insulin resistant so that because they don't respond to insulin, then the carbs will go to the tissues that are actually responding to insulin, or it will stay in the blood, avoiding that hypoglycemic state. Now that is reversible. It doesn't, yeah. take, long. It doesn't take that long. Yeah, and it takes that, a couple of weeks from what I read in the research. Exactly. Yeah. But the problem is that, okay, let's say that you are keto and you want to transition out and add carbs to your diet. At first, you don't respond well to it at yeah. all. Yeah. You get bloated. And you your know, blood sugar stays sky high. Absolutely. Yeah. Sleepiness. No and I'm glad you bring this up because I feel like that keeps a lot of people trapped on keto long term. Yeah. And they say these things like, oh, my body hates carbs. I can't eat carbs. And I'm like, no, you, it, it, what happened when you transitioned to keto? Was that a walk in the park either? No, it was not. You were like laying on your couch, freaking brain dead with the keto flu, you know, but nobody talks about this transition. That's why I'm trying to talk about it. So I appreciate that message because it's like, your body is just not used to having to respond, have an insulin response because you haven't had one at that level in so long. And so mm -hmm. this is why you see, I remember when I was keto and I would go sh have freaking cupcakes or something one day, I would literally like go into a diabetic coma. I'm not really, but I would fall asleep, literally fall asleep yes. because my, my blood sugar went so high, you know, and now that doesn't happen anymore because I'm not keto anymore. So I appreciate you sharing that message. And I want to make sure that we get into neurotyping a little bit more. So without like bogging, you know, without going crazy too scientific, can you give a little bit of rundown of the, well, I know you have more, but the basic original five neurotypes, like it, in plain language is easy to understand. Can you kind of describe each one of these people and what neurotransmitters are, are um, affecting the way they show up in life? Right. Uh, the, the one A uh, is the easy, the, the one A and the three are the easiest to understand because they are the most extreme personality. Yeah. Uh, the one A is, well, Donald Trump, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, extremely extroverted, wants to win at all costs. I mean, and I'm not saying that and saying that one A is negative. I'm just saying yeah. that it's someone who needs to lead, needs to be the leader, uh, right. wants to occupy all the space, wants to be the center of attention will do anything to win, is extraordinarily competitive, has pretty much uh, zero empathy. Uh, and it's not because he's a bad person. It's just neuro, from a neurotransmitter perspective, he doesn't have the toolbox to create that empathetic response. Like empathy in itself would be a two hours podcast. Empathy mm -hmm. to me is one of the most interesting topics. Yeah, this was it's super cool when we got into this together. I was like, yeah. whoa, the, the neurochemical uh requirement to yeah. have empathy is yeah. so fascinating <laughs> and the one a has none of it right so <laughs> they are they, they, they are not they don't have they have zero empathy and because they have zero empathy and they have a very high level of self-esteem or confidence they actually don't really care what other people think of them right I mean, you can tell anything to them and it will like and the main neurotransmitter impacting this is dopamine 
Yeah, and at first, I, I because I was basing my work on the original work of Dr. Kroninger. And the originally, he only had two types and the type one was dopamine dominant. And what he said was that they are extremely sensitive to dopamine. Right. Which is not the case, actually. I went, the, the more I learned and included huh. testing into it, uh, the more I learned that the one B that we will see afterward is the type that is extremely sensitive to both dopamine and adrenaline. I've noticed. The one A, the one a, is, the one a is different. The one A, mm. the main characteristic is he is an extremely poor methylator. Mm. Very, very low methylation. And also, most importantly, very slow COMT enzyme. Mm. The enzyme that breaks down catecholamines, including dopamine and adrenaline. Right. So the main characteristic of the 1A is that as soon as he releases adrenaline and dopamine, it stays up for almost ever. Mm. So that's why, for example, the 1A can get into, let's say, a traffic incident at 8 in the morning you will still be raging about it at eight at night. Yeah. And yeah. for the whole day, he's pissed off and angry and aggressive right. because the adrenaline from the incident will stay high for a long time because his enzyme type breaks it down very slowly. And also when you are a slow methylator, that also slows down the, 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 the breakdown of adrenaline. Yeah. So when you combine the two of it, Adrenaline stays here. And when you look yeah. at the characteristics of adrenaline, competitiveness, aggression, yep. no impatience, yep. uh, fight or flight, that's a 1A. Okay. Yep. And now because they get the same thing with, with dopamine, it means that they are also stimulus addicts. They need to win. They, need, mm -hmm. they get an amazing amount of satisfaction from completing a task from reaching a goal because what happens when you reach a goal when you well you get that dopamine release right. that gives you a pleasure response in fact motivation is almost solely a dopamine mechanism yeah uh, it, it, these these guys are always high achievers i christian i actually had a 1a client i was shocked <laughs> i'm what? like you hired a coach yeah. um but but yeah running four multi-million dollar businesses like winning 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 you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they don't sleep much because they actually don't need to sleep much mm. because as soon as they get a little bit of adrenaline, they're, they're high for the day. So, mm. so they normally don't sleep much. They can, they can work crazy hours. They don't mm. see the time pass. They will do anything to win. And they like, they are even, they are actually fairly structured in yeah. that they, they are good at establishing short-term goals because every time they reach a goal, However minor it is, they get a pleasure response. Mm -hmm. now, uh, they, they are normally, from an athletic perspective, they would be the grinders. Yeah. They don't have necessarily natural skills, uh, but they will outwork everybody. They will win through physical dominance or intimidation. Yeah, they're strong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're also not to make any one A's feel bad. If you take his test and you find out all the one A's I know, I freaking love them. I love one A's. They're always very fun people to be around. <laughs> yeah. In small doses. <laughs> yeah. Until they're pissed. <laughs> Watch well, out. They are the best people to be around as friends. Yeah. In yeah. a relationship, it's hard. I mean, you are going to have super intense moments super mm -hmm. intense because they are always high energy. They are extraordinarily charismatic yeah. because charisma comes from confidence and they yes. don't lack it. Okay. The right. The problem is that they need to control everything. Uh, they don't have patience. They don't have empathy. Yeah. <clears throat> so if they are in a relationship with someone who do need empathy, who do need to be understood, sometimes you need to take a step back. Well, it, it might lead to a conflict. And if you put two one A's together, well, oh, that's going to be like the greatest sex ever. But the <laughs> fights ever. I mean, that's going to be nasty. Right? So, yeah. And then you have the one, the one B. The one B would be uh, the. The, the natural. superstars, the superstars, <laughs> the superstars are naturally gifted, the people we yeah. hate everything, uh, because from a neurotransmitter perspective, especially when it comes to sports, yeah. but also from they, they learn everything easily. Everything comes easily to them. Oftentimes they become lazy though. 
first because, because everything comes super easy to them, mm -hmm. but also because they are, just like the two A's, they are sensitive to adrenaline because they, they break it down super fast, super fast. Mm -hmm. So these guys will be, like my wife is a 1B, right? So we, we will get into a fight. Uh, and after the fight, like nasty fight, which in my mind, I won. But of course, that's not the reality. Uh, I will be like in a corner of the room crying five minutes later. Five minutes later, she's asking me what I want for supper. It's like nothing happened. Yeah. Because her adrenaline, as soon as the, the fight is over, she can break it down super fast. COMT enzyme extraordinarily fast and very, yeah. very good methylator over yeah. methylator. So they clear mm -hmm. adrenaline super fast. The problem with that is that, well, they can actually become lazy because adrenaline is too low and it's very hard for, for them to get it up. In sports, it's great because they, they pretty much never choke under pressure. Yeah, Choking under pressure comes from an excess of adrenaline, which affects motor control mm -hmm. and muscle tone and range of motion and coordination. Uh, but they will be lazy in practice but because they have the most skill, it's really hard to get them to work harder. Like mm. to quote Alan Iverson was only practice. They can become amazing CEOs and leaders too because of this, I have found, because they, they don't want to do it. They're like, somebody else do it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. but, but they are also like the one, A, very charismatic because yeah. they also have high self-esteem. Right. Now, they, they are normally very versatile persons. They will have many, many different interests. Like they will be good at sports. They love uh, theater. They might like, they will, they want to try everything. The mm -hmm. reason is they are the newer type with the highest amount of acetylcholine. Yeah. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitters, the neurotransmitter of learning, both motor and intellectual learning. Basically it's it, it, the two interesting functions is that it stores and retrieves information. So the more mm -hmm. acetylcholine you have, the easier it is to store information, the easier it is to retrieve it. And it also speeds up everything else in your brain. Yep. So every other functions become more effective when you have acetylcholine. So learning, coordination. Yeah. And when, when your brain has a capacity, it wants to use it. So if you mm -hmm. have that capacity to store more information and with the case of acetylcholine, create connections between several things you've learned. Let's say you, a, a natural athlete might have played basketball, yep. soccer, football. Well, you can actually combine, okay, I've done this in soccer, this in basketball, and it creates new yeah. strategy, new moves out mm -hmm. of nowhere. Instinct. Yeah. I think of them as like engineer brains because so yeah. often my 1Bs are engineers or something similar to that in their professions. And I'll add real quick, my whole team is 1Bs because mm -hmm. I'm a 2A and I surround myself with 1Bs because they offset my skills really well. And one thing I love about, and that's just an idea too. It's kind of nice for hiring if you understand this system because I'm like, oh, okay, I know exactly how you tick and talk and I want to make sure we're complimentary. But they are so fast that acetylcholine, it's like the combination of being even keeled, like mm -hmm. no worries, like just super yeah. steady. But but they, they, I feel like they get shit done before I can even finish asking them. I'm like, okay, wow. How did you do that? And They're a, all like that. <laughs> and as a two way, the cool thing is that that's why I'm my girlfriend. Well, my wife now she's a one B I'm all, I'm only attracted to one B's normally. Same here. <laughs> because as a two A, two A are mimickers and they are, the two A's can easily be or be become a, a, a one B minus or yeah. a two B plus. <laughs> so if you are with a two B or a three, you become a two B plus. Mm. If you are with a one A or one B, you become a, a one B minus. <laughs> yeah. so, so it become, you become the better version of yourself and it reduces your stress level. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's to me. It, and it, by the way, that, that's what my father did. I mean, uh, he, he was a uh, human resources specialist. So, so that's the hiring person. But one, one, mm. one cool study was conducted on, and that actually goes with what you're saying and why neurotyping can actually be helpful in businesses and stuff like that is putting the right people at the right place. Right. They did a study with rats and they put six rats in a cage. Uh, and they, of course, they repeated that over and over and over and over with, several, with different rats. And, and every, every time there was two dominants who would actually beat up the, the other rats, two dom, dominated would actually go pick up the food for the dominant. 
They would mm. give the food to the dominant and the dominant would give them what was left. There was always one uh, that was independent. Mm. So he was strong enough not to get intimidated, but he didn't mix up with the other. He would pick up his own food and eat it. And he had a scapegoat who was picked on by all the other rats, okay? And they would actually take six dominant rats and put them in a cage. They would fight. Afterwards, two dominants, two dominated, one independent, one scapegoat. They would take six, six scapegoat, same thing happened. Now, the thing is that in a social setting, whatever that is, a team, normally you will have the same ratio. If you have six people, if you have 12, if you have 60, it's the kind of six kind of ratio, the same ratio. Now, ideally, you want to put people in the role they naturally fit in. Right. Because if you, are, if you have to change your personality to fit the requirement of a role, yeah. it's too much stress. I mean, yeah, I, no way. I, I, it is my belief that a lot of people who get out of the military, I, I had this discussion with uh, my, my wife's friend's new boyfriend who was in the military for like 30 years. And he never had any stress issue, even though he was like in the hard, like toughest jobs mm-hmm. and never had any PTSD or anything. I believe that those who are mentally, psychologically, the right profile for the job to be a, a, a soldier, they won't have the same negative impact even under high stress because their brain is wired for it. Mm-hmm. Whereas those who need to change their personality, let's say you are 1A. Yeah. Being told what to do, following a, st- a schedule, never uh, that that sucks. Right. But the military is great at breaking you, and yeah. you have to fit into that mold, mm-hmm. right? But once you get out, then you have to fight every decisions you make. You have a fight, inner fight between your true your true self and the program behavior. Mm-hmm. And that creates a huge, huge stress response. Wow. And you know, in, in a smaller scale, you can actually find that out if you try to pretend to be something you're not. If you create a persona because you think that's what people want to hear from you. They want to see from you. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, and I've done that for years, that's mm-hmm. actually why I stopped in-person coaching. Mm. because I had to create a persona mm. that I thought the clients wanted to see, which was far from me wow. and it would drain me, yeah. drain me. Yeah. Wow. Such a great point. And I think so many people can relate to that, especially I love, I remember you telling me that on our very first call ever about like military and like the type of people who are drawn to it are usually these rebels and adventure and I do what I want and confident I have a gun, bro. and then they just get like in this complete opposite, you know, it'd probably be better for a type three, somebody who likes yes. control and planning and organization, but those aren't, that's not how it's uh, projected on the commercials mm-hmm. for the military. So it's like the complete opposite neuro type. And then they come into the situation where they're like stuck kind of is what I see. It's like, now you're dishonorable if you leave this and they're, they're trying to be someone they're not. And I I've seen that. So I appreciate that. Okay. Let's, let's go into the two A cause that's us. Yeah. Well, two A is actually divided in two, two subtypes. So you have the the two A actor and Mm -hmm. the two A passionate. Okay. The two A actor is very, that's probably you very close to the one B. Yeah. Very close, very yeah. close. In fact, if they are in an optimized state, they can be exactly like a 1B. Yeah, I resonate with 1B pretty hard. Yeah, from a, from a neurotransmitter perspective, it's it's almost the same. The mm-hmm. only difference is probably in methylation status. Yep. They have a, they, they have a little worse methylation than the, the 1B, mm-hmm. which leads to a little bit less acetylcholine and a little bit less serotonin. Mm. But it's still, it's still pretty high. So it, it's pretty darn close. So from a motor learning perspective, from a skill set perspective, mm-hmm. from a personally standpoint, they are very close to the 1B, but they're going to have more empathy and they care more about what other people think of them. Mm-hmm. So, so, but it, it's, it's very close, okay? You yeah. could actually I, say that you are 1B and you would be, pretty right right and yeah. then you have the, the you have the 2a uh passionate who's more like me 
the two a passionate has less methylation, much less. So he has a lot less serotonin and a lot less acetylcholine. But both are very sensitive to adrenaline. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the main difference is that the two way actor can actually modulate his behavior by himself fairly easily. Okay. I'm today. I need to be this Tara. That's the person I need mm -hmm. to be today. I'm putting my, my, my mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneur hat on. I'm putting my podcast host on. I'm putting, so you can very easily change how you are voluntarily and then yeah. switch back when needed. Okay. Yeah. And that doesn't cause that much stress. Mm -hmm. The reason is higher acetylcholine, higher serotonin. The two neurotransmitter that allows you to love variation and to be able to really change behavior easily, mm -hmm. to adapt to different situations. Yeah. Acetylcholine, serotonin are the neurotransmitter of adaptability. Yeah. So that's why, for example, the 1A, very low acetylcholine, so they're not adaptable. They, they stay the same regardless of the situation. That's why they will be very mm -hmm. improper in some situations. They will be the people cracking jokes and talking loud at, at a funeral. Because they mm -hmm. just can't tone it down. That's how they are. That's mm -hmm. how they are. They have low serotonin. They have low acetylcholine. They can't adapt. Okay, just mm -hmm. like the type three, also the same thing. Type three yeah. and type one A are actually very similar from a neurotransmitter perspective. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to that later. But a two A actor can easily change his personality based on the situation. The two A passionate lets the situation change him slight difference okay he's not in control of his change of behavior now i cannot on purpose let seminar chris comes out <laughs> i need that adrenaline i cannot fake it it's impossible mm. okay mm. now I, I can't i know that if i'm seminar chris let's say i'm single i know that if i'm seminar chris and i go to bars I'm not coming home alone, right? Regardless of how <laughs> badly shaved I am, right? So if I could voluntarily summon Seminar Chris, I would not have stayed single and virgin until I was 22, right? <laughs> So Guys, hold on. I'm going to interject real quick because if you haven't seen Christian present at a seminar, he is the most dynamic. You're the most dynamic speaker. I mean, you're literally at some points almost like yelling on the stage and you've got your stick and it's like super compelling. I mean, it is like, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's extremely engaging and it's a bit of a show and it's, it's, it's awesome, you know, but that, just so you guys have a picture of what he's talking about. <laughs> but, but you know, actually there's a scientific reason behind it. Well, there's a purpose for it. Yeah. And, sure. and, and some people, I mean, some of you might, might, might know who Greg Doucette is. Uh, he's cool. a bodybuilder guy. He's very popular on YouTube, like 3 okay. million followers or something, okay. like bodybuilder. And he's like, at least as loud as I am, if not more. And with a very <laughs> annoying voice, also from Canada. Anyway, uh, and A, you love him or you hate him with the same intensity. But, you know... And studies have found that, no, memory. Memory is a selective process. Now, you, you don't store everything that happens to you in your brain. You, you'd go crazy. It's impossible to okay. store every little piece of in sensory information you are under every single day. You only store the important information or the important events, okay? And even those that are, end up being stored in your brain, there, there is an hierarchy there. Some will be occupy a bigger place that will be more easily retrieved mm -hmm. when needed. So the body needs a system to know which event requires a greater place in your brain, which one is more important. And the main factor that tells your brain which is important is the emotional state you are in when it happens. The more intense the emotion, positive or negative, the greater place in your brain a memory will occupy and the easier it is to retrieve it, which is actually to come back to our PTSD thing. Okay. And I'm not just talking about military, anybody who has a super stressful event happen to them. The reason why these people will often like wake up and feel like they are really uh, 
reliving the moment, they are actually are in their brain because it, it, the emotional state they were in when it happened was so powerful that it occupies a humongous part in the brain and it's super easily retrieved. Mm. So as soon as the brain is amped up from adrenaline, from stress, your neurons start firing and firing and firing and your brain doesn't get fired and do nothing, right? So when, when those neurons get firing, you need to occupy your brain with something. And if you don't do something voluntarily, the brain will decide what happens. And that's, that, that's anxiety. The panic attacks is when your brain, your neurons are firing so fast and you're not doing anything. So your brain decides what to do and you feel like you're losing control of your thought process. Now, if you have that one huge memory that occupies such a huge place and is easily retrieved, as soon as you get that anxious state, boom, that comes out, that comes out. And because the emotions were so strong when it happened, you start with, you store that memory with such vivid feelings and images, you, the emotions themselves that you felt when it happened are actually stored in your brain and they come out also. So now you have that memory that becomes emotionally charged. And actually, you know what? And I'm, I'm going to talk against psychologists, but not really. Okay, both my parents are psychologists. And the thing is, psychology actually works, just like any other kind of therapy, it works. But psychologists, they don't understand why it works. They like to have those big theories and those big techniques and exercises and drills just to feel like they are more important than they really are. <laughs> really, a psychologist is essentially a friend to whom you talk to because the benefit of going to a therapist is decreasing the emotional load of those memories by talking about it. Yeah. And by talking about it, oftentimes you, you have drills that psychologists psychologist will use that actually work. And these are the drills that force you to describe those events as if you were an observer, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm describing what is happening to Christian. I'm right. taking an objective position, right. right? removing on purpose that emotional load. Totally. So the purpose of psychology is not to get rid of the memory. You can't do that. It's safe forever. It will never get out of your brain. The only thing you can do is remove the negative emotional load that yeah. comes out. And when you do that, even if the memory is retrieved, it doesn't impact you the same way. Yeah. 100%. And the more you talk about it and you talk about it objectively and trying to, uh, well, anything, the more you talk about it, the more desensitized you become to it anyway. So that's why yeah. psychology works. Not because of some voodoo shit. It's because yeah. you remove the emotional load of an event by talking about it. And especially if you talk about it objectively. Yeah. I love, I love how you're describing like the blending of the, the, the chemical reaction that's happening as a result of these memories, you know, like Joe Dispenza will talk about being addicted to certain emotions. And when we get into certain States, the same chemicals get released. And so we'll actually find different people and places to refill that addiction because we like how adrenaline feels. We like how dopamine feels. Right. And so it's, it's cool when we can dive in and find out like chemically what's happening to cause the reaction in us. And I'd say that's, that's kind of neurotyping in a nutshell is like, what is happening neurochemically under the scenes that's causing you, this guy to be super outgoing, uber confident, no patience. And, you know, and this woman over here to be like, am I doing it right? Is, is it exactly 500 milligrams or is 550 okay? Or, you know, so it's like what finding out like what's going on under the surface to cause that is so fun. I'm obsessed with it. I have become obsessed with neurotransmitters since doing this work with you. It's so fun. Another example, and I'm, I'm going to like go to the type two, but I'm not talk about them because we still have uh, the type two B to talk about. Yeah. The, even the two A's. Uh, but uh, just one example of what you mentioned. Uh, I remember um, Charles Polican. Now, Charles was not known for his patience or yeah. for his tact. 
he was not really tactful. I mean, you, yeah. you have some stories, right? Let me, yes. And let me real quick for, if you don't know who Charles is, you, a, a lot of my listeners may are probably familiar with Dave Asprey and Dave Asprey's book, uh, Game Changers, he dedicated to Charles and called him basically the father of biohacking. So Charles mm-hmm. is super highly revered in the strength coaching industry and really led the way on a lot of this deeper, um, yeah. what's going on under the surface in our bodies and was a mentor to you for a long time. You guys, you know him personally, and, and he has his own sort of version of this same work that he does with you know well, different types I, that was my uh, that was my my first introduction into what would become neurotyping right uh, because he wrote an article called the five elements of training yes basically using the five signs of the chinese uh, yeah. uh philosophy and each personality type which would become the one uh, yeah the, the fire the hurt the metal the wood the water anyway so and so well, the, the water type, you need to train them a certain way. They are like this, like that. Mm-hmm. And you use the Braverman test, which is extraordinarily yeah. limited because it doesn't, it doesn't test for adrenaline, which is probably the most important neurotransmitter when it comes yeah. to personality. It doesn't test for glutamate. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, so, so when I applied the system, you know, and it made, it made a lot of sense, it worked 6.5 times out of 10. So I wanted more. So that was my introduction to that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, so Charles once wrote in that article, okay, uh, talking about the metal types, which are my type threes. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, because he was giving guidelines on all, how to train each type. And he said, well, yeah. the, the metal type, I don't train them. That was his recommendation. And he really yeah, he won't he won't work with them at all. These no. are and we'll he'll get to it in a second, guys. But these are the am I doing everything just right yeah. types? Yeah. The, re- the reason is, and I could actually see it when he interacted with people online answering questions, because you always have those asking those, okay. For example, <laughs> let's say, okay, let, let's say you give a, a recommendation on squatting, okay. Yeah on a video, whatever, and say, yeah, but I've seen a video by Chris Duffin and he recommends doing it another way. Yeah. Who's right? Right. And Charles would take that personally. Because he's a 1A, I'm sure, oh, yeah. right? So yeah. 1A <laughs> plus, 1A yeah. plus. <laughs> and zero patience. So when he tells you to do something, you do it. So right. he can't stand someone, for example, you, a type three, you will explain out of squad for 15 minutes and they right. will still ask you 10 questions. Right. And it's not because they don't trust you. It's not because they don't understand. They are actually super smart normally. Right. Because they are naturally more anxious and they need to be 100% certain of what they need to do. In fact, what motivates them when it comes to training is technical mastery. Yes. A lot, a lot more than gains at making technical improvement. That's why, for example, Okay, type three, think of the typical, we will find them more in marathon runners and the uh, loner type activities or stamp collecting or stuff like that. <laughs> or in training, maybe the, the, the functional only body weight yeah. crowd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it, it, you know what? Functional training actually fits them pretty well. Yeah. I, and I'm not going to debate the usefulness of doing uh, <laughs> curls on one leg on a Swiss ball. Okay. <laughs> but from a technical mastery standpoint, yeah, they would we'll geek out on that. A, we'll give them a bone to chew for several months, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but when that person walks in the first time, let's say like the typical type three, the accountant, the introverted, uh, nerdy, geeky type, the instinct is I'm going to give them all machines. Because <laughs> that, clearly that person is not built to strength train. That's the worst thing you can do because th- they need right. challenge. You know, a leg press, they, there's no technical mastery involved. They love to learn movements. They learn to yeah. learn a task. But you need to give them lots of explanation. Mm-hmm. Like when you write a program, for example, you need very clear and detailed information. Because if you don't give them, they will look elsewhere to get it. They love yeah. to research. Love yes. to research. And they will tell you, I've, I've read this. Yeah. Are you, do you agree? It's different. Why are you, why do you, don't you have me use that? So yep. they, I love type threes because they have really up-leveled my coaching game because yes. they want an answer for everything, you know? Really? And I'm like, okay, let me get that for you, you know? And right. they, they, they help me see my holes in coaching because they, they'll all start asking. I'm like, okay, I need to tell people out of the gate this because my type threes are always going to come back and ask me, you know? So they're really attentive to detail. But that's such a great attitude to have though, because, you know, you see them as a way to better yourself. Whereas 
other most coaches will actually see them as a pain in the ass and they are really not you need to no. understand they're not annoying people they're doing that because okay they will feel anxious about an exercise as long as they don't know 100% certainty yep. that they will do the movement correctly and these are the people for example you put the empty bar on on squat not, not, not the empty bar uh, no, body weight squat Okay, first time they walk into the gym, you explain them how to do a body weight squat and they do a perfect body weight squat. The moment you put a bar on their, you, you have a goblet squat, perfect technique. The moment you put a bar on their back, even if it's lighter than the goblet they use, <laughs> they can't go lower than half squat, back round, hip shift forward because the weight on the spine causes anxiety. Okay. Mm. And that's something you need to consider when you are changing exercises with them, when you are introducing new movement that might cause a higher stress yeah. level because, because of a factor that you or me or anybody who loves lifting would not even consider. Okay? Right. For right. us, putting a bar on our back, it's, it's zero stress. It's fun. Fact, <laughs> it's fun, yeah. But someone who's never lifted before... Right huge stress especially for a type three mm -hmm. you need to start them with a, a, an easier version and once they've mastered the movement pattern then you can mm -hmm. gradually complify complexify it yeah and this is a great example of why this is so helpful for training. Cause like once I, this is the first thing my clients do is I know so much about them. Once I get their neurotype result, I know so much. I know about their personality. I know how they respond to different nutrition. I know what kind of training to put them on. And cause like, you know, if you're working with one of my like post NFL guys that I have right now, who they were like one B one a borderlines. And I put him on the same kind of training that I put his two B wife on or a type three, they're not going to do it. First of all, cause I'm like, this is boring and pointless and I'm not doing it. And you put, try to put the type three on the one a plan and they're never going to get results because they're going to be too scared to actually perform. So it's so helpful. So anyway, I love, I love those examples. And I'm wondering, can we hit two B's real quick? Cause I like, <laughs> I like your explanation. You help me understand two B's quite a lot. Yeah. By, by the way, the two A just to finish, mm -hmm. uh, both are highly driven by, well, the, the two A passionate more than the two a actor because the two a actor could actually be a, a, like a in this on the spectrum of one b yeah so the, the the two a passion is highly driven by the need to please others he needs the respect admiration love uh, of others the worst thing for type two a is to feel disrespected you know mm -hmm. i and I was having this discussion with my wife. We were uh, walking down the street and one of the neighbor comes up and he, he's like clearly, clearly hitting on her. I mean, it's, it's not even, uh, I, I, I don't get pissed because I don't get pissed, but I, I, I told you, I really hate it when guys just walk up to you and they just hit on you. And see, he was just being friendly, dude. There's no such thing as a man you don't know just being <laughs> friendly when you're strolling down the street. <laughs> so she said, well, well, you're jealous. Man, I'm, I'm zero jealous. I could, I, I could tell you stories. Like, I'm not a jealous <laughs> person at all, right? But, but you feel what, disrespected. I feel disrespected. That's yeah. what's annoyed me. Like, if I'm driving and someone cuts me off, I feel disrespected. That annoys the shit out of me. Not because I'm not going to be late. I don't care. But I feel I, that's a lack of respect, okay? Yeah. Anyway, so now the 2A, they need to feel respected. The, the, the worst thing to do to a 2A, especially passionate, is show them disrespect. The 2Bs, okay? 2Bs are the most emotional types. Yeah. We also have uh, two subtypes. You have the 2B, uh, 2B artist, and you have the 2B uh, confident, confidant. Okay, mm -hmm. but but the, the main main underarching team of the two B is emotions. Okay, uh, they have by far the highest amount of empathy mm -hmm. because they have very high glutamate and very low GABA. Mm -hmm. okay? You cannot have high glutamate and high GABA at the same time because g glutamate is converted to GABA and vice versa. Mm -hmm. GABA can be reconverted to glutamate depending on nut nutrition and, and stress level. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so two Bs have high glutamate, low GABA, and that makes them moody, emotional, uh, poor sleep. They take everything personal. Uh, 
they, 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 they also have lower self-esteem. Uh, they need to be loved. They need to be respected and admired, okay? Now, glutamate, the way it works, okay? And glutamate is, when you look at the literature, the function you'll find is it's involved mostly in memory. It helps with memory. <laughs> and that's true. But in reality, it's, it's much deeper than that. Glutamate is an emotional amplifier. It increases the intensity of your emotions, both good or bad. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go back to what I said earlier about selective memorization, mm -hmm. what is the main thing that decides if you store something with a large space in your brain? It's emotion state, emotional state. The more emotional you are, stronger emotionally you are in a moment, the more likely you are to store it large place in your brain. Glutamate, by increasing emotional or emotion intensity, it increases memorization. So yes, it increases memory, but in large part by amplifying emotions. Okay? There are other mechanisms, of course, but that's the main factor. Now, the two Bs being very high in, in glutamate, from they, they will have those huge mood swings. Actually, these are the people who respond the best to keto diet. Yeah. Uh, especially in the short term. I, I, yeah. I use keto. I use keto. Normally, it's going to be four to six weeks, three to five weeks, three to six weeks. Yeah. Uh, because the, it, it, to me, from, okay, from a brain chemistry perspective, keto does the following. It increases dopamine and, and adrenaline. Okay. Uh, it increases GABA by increasing the conversion of glutamate into GABA. So right. keto decreases glutamate. Right. It decreases GABA. It also decreases serotonin. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and it can increase or be neutral for, for acetylcholine. So, so we already covered the impact of increasing adrenaline and dopamine. It gives you that, that sensation of energy, mm -hmm. but it can backfire by making you resistant mm -hmm. to these neurotransmitters. And, and you mentioned earlier about those personality that, that when, when you become addicted to a certain type of person because they give you an emotion you crave that same type of person and you want more mm -hmm. because the thing is you become desensitized right. to that intensity. So you want someone, so you have that person that, that triggers a, an emotion. After a while, you, well, I'm getting bored of that person because my neurotransmitters yeah. are downregulated. They, they adapted to this intensity of stimulation. I need a more intense stimulation <laughs> and you graduate. Yeah. So, so, so that's why you all, you, you never step down, always step up, right? Yeah. Until that step up is that step too much. And then you are going to start the relationship. Okay. Yep. <laughs> no, that's a great point. And I, I love how you're, you're basically describing going through phases of keto. And I, my listeners obviously know that's how I feel too, uh, um, keto in and out, but it's kind of like going off caffeine for a little while to resensitize your receptors or, you know, anything that way. So it's smart. Once you understand that to me, okay, if you want to lose weight, caloric deficit. If you want to gain muscle, caloric surplus. Okay, that's the first thing. So, but you can have a, a caloric deficit with any type of diet. Now, the second step is what changes do I need to trigger in my brain to feel better, hmm. to become the better version of myself? Mm -hmm. uh, you can do this on the short term or, or in a longer term to reprogram your behavior with other approaches combined mm -hmm. into that. Again, okay, mm -hmm. to be, I like to start them on a keto diet because that will bring their glutamate to more manageable levels. So now they will become the people who, who report less anxiety, more even mood on mm -hmm. keto. These are the people who had high glutamate. Mm -hmm. and, and they will have less depression symptoms because glutamate is neurotoxic. Yeah. So they feel better. So as a tool to bring glutamate down and GABA up, keto is awesome. Okay. Yeah. It takes four to six weeks, mm -hmm. but after that point, the adrenaline excess can cause down regulation of the adrenergic receptors and you can have what we call a burnout. Yeah. Okay? And now you start to have depression symptoms again, and you can also become resistant to dopamine bringing motivational mm -hmm. decreases, decrease in motivation. Mm -hmm. You have serotonin comes down, which makes yeah. you a lot less adaptable. Right. right. So, so it's not a great long-term approach unless you have someone who has naturally super high level of serotonin. Right. And, 
and very high level of, of glutamate, you can probably stay on that for, for, for right. quite a while. And I love this aspect that you bring to keto is, is talking about this. It's like, um, I'm very turned off the world right now, as we know, it is like, here's the way here's the, here's the optimal way to eat. And what you're saying is like, well, it depends. It depends yeah. on the person. It depends on where you're starting. If you're a low serotonin person already, and let's say you already have high GABA, you're not going to be like, yeah, you're going to be like crying and emotional because your serotonin is going to drop. You're going to, you're not going to get good sleep. Yeah. And so that's why the next person they had, they had super high serotonin. And they're like, no, no, no. I sleep great on keto. And it's like, yeah, because you guys didn't start in the same place. So I love that you're bringing that awareness. Yeah, And just like you can have people who will actually feel absolutely amazing on a diet of 80% carbs. Right. Well, 70% carb. If they have have extremely low serotonin and extremely like, for example, my original recommendation for 1A was a low carb diet. Because in my original system, I assume, well, they are sensitive to dopamine, so you need more dopamine. In reality, they are actually under, they, they're not good at breaking down adrenaline. So in fact, you want to minimize adrenaline with the type 1A. So they yeah. actually do better on a higher carbs diet mm-hmm. to try to keep them even more even killed. Like the 1A mm-hmm. has adrenaline to the roof because he can't break it down. Dopamine to the roof because he can't break it down. Acetylcholine is very low. Uh, then you have glutamate, who is basically non-existent. That's why they associate right. that. Uh, GABA is very, very high. Very, very right. high. That's why they, they don't choke under pressure. Right. And serotonin is very low. So they actually need carbs that will bring up serotonin, bring down acetylcholine, so they become more balanced. However, not all the time. Okay? Yeah. If you are that CEO of a big company, we is in a crucial part, big, big merger, big takeover to plan. Maybe he wants to be an asshole. Yeah. Maybe he wants all the side effects of being that aggressive warrior. Right. So go low carbs. Right. Totally. And that's what, you know, I appreciated you telling me that when I had that 1A client, we did do a phase of keto and I was like, Hey, can you please let your wife know that you're going to be like even more (laughs) confident? Don't give an F. No, not super sensitive. (laughs) The ones they actually feel awesome on keto. Yeah. They They like it. That feeling. They feel super charged. Yeah. But but you know what? You have people around you, right? Yeah. About them, but they can be useful. Mm -hmm. So try Mm -hmm. not to uh, antagonize them too much. Well, and I love that perspective too. You know, like I think maybe even five years ago, it was like, this is how you do a squat. You know, like when I got my NASM textbook certification, it was like, this is the proper way to do a squat. And then as you get more advanced, you're like, well, what are you trying to do? What do you want to bias? You want to bias your quads? You want to bias your glutes? Like what, what, what's the intention? And I love that you're bringing that to nutrition from a neurotransmitter standpoint too. Of like, well, what are you trying to achieve? You know, maybe you want to go in gangster go mode for four weeks while you build your business, you know, but, but just be aware of what's happening on the inside of you. So then you can modify that when you don't want to be in that mode anymore. It's cool. It's, it's really, I, I love this shit. I think it is like very, very cutting edge approach to nutrition. So, you know, I know you've taken some slack from it. I know that it's like, you're in that, I call them the Poliquinites. You're in that strength yeah. coach community of all the, like, I'm right. I'm right. <laughs> and well, so I know they like to fight you on it, but I, I have found nothing but tremendous results from my clients and also my ability to coach them well from using this. So I use it with every single client. I see neurotyping like I see a Zercher squat. You know, for people who don't know what a Zercher squat is, a squat with the bar cradle between in your elbows. It's uh, so painful, Christian. It's so painful. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> but if you use a bigger bar or wear a hoodie, it's fine. Okay. Uh, of course, if you're super lean, that's not super ple- pleasant. But, and the thing is, people will, will, will write against the Zercher because oh, you're going to be limited by your arm strength. Well, that's because you've never done a zercher. Yes, it's not comfortable. Once, once, once you get used to it, the arms are not holding anything. It's basically just in, it's, it's your yeah. shoulder, it's your back. Right. I've had most people, once they get comfortable with the zercher, they can do about the same as they can use on the front squat. In fact, I have a client who can zercher squat more than he can full squat. And he's not a weak guy. He can zercher 500. So that, that, that's wow. Cool. wow. Yeah, yeah. And he's not curling 500. 
you, you so, that's what, cool. what I'm, yeah yeah it's like a lever it's a, you're not like using yeah. muscular strength that's amazing though what, what, yeah. what, I, what i mean by that is that you are criticizing something on what you're seeing on the surface yeah. instead of actually trying it to right what's actually working i'm not saying a deserter squat is a great movement for everybody i mean but it has its purpose but yeah I'm, yeah but don't criticize something until you understand what's going on. Then you can decide whether you want to use it or not. Yep. That's why I did my bodybuilding competition. And that, you know what? That's where we can wrap up on because this is where we connected recently on Facebook. I had done my bodybuilding competition. And I, the only reason I did it is what you just said. I was like, I'm being hypercritical of bodybuilding and I've never done it. And I hate people like that. And I don't want to be one of them. I want to just stand on the sidelines and be, what do I call them? Like a um, recliner ref watching an yeah. NFL game. Like, oh, that's stupid. But <laughs> like, you don't know. Well, I did two shows back to back. The first one, I think I kind of had my rose colored glasses on. I was like, this is really good. It's like really good for discipline. And like, wow, these people are like totally hard workers. And, you know, and then by the second one, I don't know what happened. I was just like, this is not it. This is like everything I hate about health and fitness. It's like your whole life has to suck in order for you to look good. And this insurmountable amount of focus on this one area of my life. I'm like, I just want to go in the freaking Canyon with my kids and have a picnic and have a goddamn s'more with them. Like, I don't want to live this life. And so anyway, I know you just did your photo shoot. And of course you look amazing. I mean, you guys, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the picture of Christian behind him. I mean, he's like, wow, like one of the best physiques in the biz but yeah well, actually, can you share your thoughts to be honest i mean the the, the the once the photos come out i mean it's decent but honestly it was it was really like a miracle because what i meant i, I mean i lost 40 pounds in six weeks first of that's all that's crazy yeah but the, 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 the main issue is that when i started out i almost had zero upper body mass because mm. well for a year i didn't train i only played golf and really? when i was training yeah. What, right before year. that? Yeah, last year. Oh, well, last I didn't year. know that. Yeah, well, well, last summer I played golf the whole summer. So I would, was at a course five days a week. So I, I didn't really train. Uh, before that, in the winter before that, my whole training was geared toward being able to, I, I used to compete in golf. I used to be pretty, a pretty good oh, golfer. Cool. So okay. I, I spent the whole winter like preparing my body to be able to swing because I lost my nice. mobility. So, so I, I basically stopped all upper body training uh, did lots of right. core work uh, and kept my, my lower body strong because it's, it's more needed. Uh, and then after that, uh, I, I started my, my um, off-season training for golf again. I did a bit more per body, but more explosive work. Pause real quick. Can you please create a program for golfers? Because I get asked this all the time and yeah. I can just send them to your website. I, I, okay. I actually <laughs> wanted to do one. I actually wanted to do one. Yeah. And, um, so uh, after that, I, 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 I actually prioritized my training for golf specifically. So mm -hmm. I, I added more upper body work, but it was mostly for power and, and cool. not, not muscle mass. I didn't want to gain muscle, actually, because I, I, I have short arms. So from a lever perspective, having a big chest, it, it completely yeah, yeah. So that kind of sucked. <laughs> so and then my wife got pregnant. For, with our second kid mm -hmm. and I kept training I, I, I was still practicing golf and I didn't figure out you know what there's no way in hell I can I can play golf now mm -hmm. because you know she's she would be breastfeeding and I cannot justify going to the club five times a week either to practice for three hours or play for five yeah. uh, when she hasn't slept all night and she right. because because of COVID we didn't have uh, any daycare daycare for the first kid so I'm not going to leave her alone for right. five hours a day. Right. So I, so I said, well, I'm not going to play golf. So I said, well, I'm gonna, I, need, I, need, I need a new goal now. So let's, I want to go back to squatting 500. So me, because I, I'm an excessive personality. So for six weeks, seven weeks, all my training was focused on, on bringing my squat up. To do that, I, I dramatically reduced my upper body work, even more so than it was, to give more recovery for my lower body. I was squatting three or four days a week. Uh, and after that, because I piled on too much weight to get there, we, I got there. I, I didn't look exactly sexy. So I said, I'm going to get back in shape. I, I saw like a, uh, MMA fight. I want to look like these guys. <laughs> so I, I, I built in my, uh, after all these years in the biz guys, if that doesn't make you feel better, even Christian gets those little motivated moments. I, I, I'm, like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still the guy who will <laughs> see a ripped guy into the gym. <laughs> Fuck this, I'm dieting. And, uh, 
And so, so I, I started my diet, but not for a photo shoot, just to get into MMA type shape. That's why I was carrying the bag and hitting the heavy bag. Mm. And after a week or two of that, I said, dude, I could actually look pretty, pretty good. So I started doing bodybuilding work, but really I basically trained my upper body only for five weeks while I was eating almost nothing. So some photos actually look pretty awesome because the abs are great. But my upper body, like right now, I'm like 10 times bigger. Now I'm back up to being like 225. Oh, uh, wow. You know what? I actually, I, I haven't gained that much fat, which actually nice. pisses me off because <laughs> I, I look emaciated during the, and felt like crap for six weeks for nothing, for no reason. Mm. Now, after that photo shoot, I realized, you know what? This fucking sucks. Yeah. And that's, that's not what I want. I mean, not, not now. Maybe when I was like 24, 25, that's totally. cool. You know what? I have two kids. I, and I, I didn't have enough energy to play with them. I, I, yeah. I wanted to kick my dogs, for God's sake. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I do now is I have three, three workouts a week and normally it's Amazing. Monday, Monday, normally it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you know what, if it's, it's, it's Saturday, if it's Sunday, it doesn't really matter. And uh, it's whole body workouts mm-hmm. and uh, it's strength work. You know, I hate bodybuilding. I yeah. Hate, I mean, you, you've I've, always I've, been a strength guy. Yeah, I've, I've done bodybuilding because I've been branded a bodybuilding guy. And because I have a low self-esteem, I felt like I <laughs> needed to look the part. Right. It really doesn't matter. Right. So, yeah. Uh, and you know what? My, my, my strength is getting back up. I'm enjoying my training. And that's the, that's the important part. I mean, if yeah. you don't enjoy your training and you're ruining your life for it, why right. do it? So anyway, and I'm, I'm nutrition. I'm eating what I want. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I think, you know, it's, there's always this dangling carrot when you haven't had something before, right? Like everybody wants to be a millionaire or everybody wants to have a million dollar body. And then when sometimes you find out what it actually takes to get there, especially with the body thing, and we've both been there of getting super shredded, super lean, you realize the sacrifice that has to come in your life to achieve that. And you're like, no, thanks. Like not appealing to me. And I I'm flat out with my clients about it. I'm like, we can get you there, but this is what it's going to be like. Like, this is going to be an insurmountable focus in your life. Do you want that for sure? The thing is, the thing is that you no, know, once you get there, and except for some exception, like people who are genetically lean, for example. Yes, the, yeah. those people are easy. Yeah. <laughs> They're pretty close already. But but anybody else, when they get to that state, they will feel like crap. Yep. Let's say twenty-two hours and a half per day. Yep. Probably. You, yep. So you are in great shape. You look at yourself in a mirror. So that's your like five minutes where you are happy. Right. But the rest of the day, you don't even enjoy it. You don't, you, you don't, you. You get an matter. ego boost periodically. Somebody at the that's store right. will say something to you. Right. Someone will stop you with the gym and you're kind of running on fumes of the ego boost. Yeah. But most of the time, what I found is you're just chronically thinking about food. It's just right. this chronic laser focus right. of like, okay, just eat this and then you can make it till the next time. Like, it's just, I mean, it's no way to live. Honestly, in my opinion, I'm not saying we we're still in in shape. We're still fit, you know, but like, it doesn't have to be so extreme. And I really think social media and this competitive attitude is like, I have to be the most shredded. And I see those people now. And I'm like, why would you want to look like that? I know what's going behind the scenes. Like no way. No, that's the thing also, right. Is that, you know, to most people, okay. The, the, the training community or the Instagram community is not real life. If you go walk, uh, take a walk uh, downtown or whatever, right? you will be the person who's the most in shape anyway. People right. don't know the difference if you have six biceps veins or four biceps veins. Right. You're the only <laughs> one, you're the only person who cares about it. Right. It, it's funny because my, my wife and I are going on vacation. And in the past, every time I would go on vacation and say, well, I need to dive down to look super shredded on the beach. And I would suffer for like four weeks and get there and everybody's fucking fat to do right. that. I could, right. have been, I could have stopped training for right. a month and ate, eat McDonald's five times a, a day. And I would have been miles ahead of everybody here. So why did I just completely mess up my life? For that. Right. Yeah. It's like, once you get in that rabbit hole, it gets so extreme. And I remember when I was first getting fit, I was meeting these people who were bodybuilding and I'm looking at them. Like you're the fittest person I've ever seen. You have a six pack. Like in mm. my world, that was not a normal, no one I knew had a six pack. So I'm seeing this person with muscles and six pack and they're like, Oh, I'm so chubby right now. And oh, yeah. I was like, 
yeah. what are you being serious? But I could tell they meant it, you know? And so it's really, you get, it can get, uh, you can get caught up in this crazy standard exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's so unhealthy. It takes over your life. I remember like apologizing to my kids, like guys, hang in there with me for three yeah. more weeks. I promise we can get back Done to it. normal family life soon, but it's like, it takes a lot, you know, and I, okay. I just want to create that awareness from both of us have been down that road. It's like, you can do it. Sure. It's just, it's going to take an insurmountable amount of focus. It's going to take time away from your family and friends, and you're going to be pretty miserable. So yeah. heads some, up. People do love it. some people love it. And, and some it, love it. it. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. Okay. It, 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 it's about, well, motivation, yes and no. It's more about needs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you have low self-esteem, for example, if you don't have real accomplishments in life, yeah, then having the best physique around yeah. might be worth the suffering because it will be your validation. It's the one thing that makes you feel good. And basically, what, when you are suffering through the process, just imagining everybody is going to look at me like I'm, uh, they're going to like, think I'm awesome. They're going to admire me. Just thinking about that, it actually gives you joy. Okay. Yeah. And that actually makes them want to do it. Right. And once they get there, because they have nothing else, then it's worth it. And yeah. because I did it for years. I mean, even though I'm a strength guy, I'm my bodybuilding period. You know, we mentioned keto. I was, I was keto for 18 months straight uh, because that's the only thing that me, I could get shredded. Not because the reason is that for me, high carbs was high donuts. So I didn't have like, that balanced thing. So, uh, <laughs> so I got like super lean and said, okay, I'm never, I'm never gaining an ounce of fat ever again, ever again. So most miserable two years of my life and no friends, no social activities. Yeah. But yeah. to me, it was worth it. Because at that point in my life, you no, know, I didn't have any professional accomplishments yet. Mm. Uh, I, I wasn't. I, I, didn't, I was not in a relationship. Uh, I had no kids. Uh, I didn't have money. I didn't have a cool car. Yeah. Uh, so I was, uh, no books yet. So that, that to me, that kept me sane. It kept me yeah. feel good about myself because yeah. I had also self esteem issues. Yeah. But you know what? The thing is that if you need to rely on how good you look, to feel validated as a human being, you might want to look at your priorities or your accomplishments or how you choose to live your life. Yeah, you might want to go do some plant medicine and heal that shit. <laughs> at least that was for me because when I got fit, I'm very open about this. My marriage was going to crap. Mm. I took it all personally. I thought I wasn't enough for him. And so what was I doing? It's this unconscious behavior of like, now I'm going to be enough. Watch, you know, and a lot of beauty became was born out of that low self-esteem place, you know, and mm. I'm, I'm grateful for that period. But I like your perspective of like, sometimes people don't have anything and they're anchoring to something that helps them feel good about themselves. But there is like another step, you know, it's like, if your value is wrapped up in your body, the dark side of that is once your body doesn't look to the standard that you think it should, now you're depressed. Now you have no worth. Now you're not enough. Now you're, you know, this, this is what I see leads people into like binging on all the things. And then they go exercise for three hours and they're like, no. And then they're fasting and they're kind of trapped in this place because their, their worth as a human being is wrapped up into their body. And that's a, that's a scary place to be. And I I'm grateful for the healing that I've had to get past that. And what's crazy is like, I think the fear that held me in it for the longest was that I was worried. I was scared of, um, like, if I let this go and then I had all these stories of what that meant, I won't, uh, like guys won't like me or my business will go to shit or like, Oh, you know, I had all these fear stories and I had to go deep and address all of those. And, and, and I, now I realize, Oh my gosh, I take care of my body even better than I ever did because I don't have all these like manic behaviors. You know <laughs> Looking like you do now looks a lot better than stage ready. <laughs> And even for a guy, it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, I remember. I agree. Uh, I was in I was in Colorado uh, at Biotest headquarters, and uh, Tim Patterson is the owner of Biotest and T Nation. Mm. Uh, look at me and say, you know, because he saw my my bodybuilding pictures. He saw me when I was bodybuilding. He say, you look a lot better when you're not trying to be a bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah, uh, because, I agree. Yeah, anyway, so and also one thing that people forget is that you know. 
a picture or video on social media doesn't tell you the backstory. Okay. Everybody looks happy. Everybody looks awesome. I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. Very quick story. It is not about physique, but it tells you that what you see on the internet is not the whole story. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, I was in Colorado. I was, I was training at Bautes headquarters and I was doing snatch grip high pulls, which is an Olympic lifting movement where you mm. basically explode and pull the bar to roughly mid chest level, very explosive mm. movement. Yeah. So Tim walks in and said, dude, that, well, not dude, because he's not a guy who says dude, but he's Christian, that's a really impressive movement. I mean, it's violent, it's explosive, but it's not so technical that a normal person can't learn it. Like, not, yeah. not like a snatch. I mean, it would, I had like two plates on, like 225. I said, well, Christian, it would be like really impressive, really cool if we film something like four plates a side. Say, so I have 225, like that would be like four or four or five. Even when I compete in Olympic weightlifting, I didn't do that. I'm pulling uh -huh. 400 pounds up to mid chest level. Okay. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, it would be really interesting if we film four plates a side. Like, do you want a paycheck next week? Right. So for the next three and a half weeks, <laughs> I know all, I did, <laughs> all I did was <laughs> match grip high pulls six days a week. Twice a day, boom, boom, high pull, high pull, low pull with more weight, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, three weeks later, on on a on a Friday, the crew comes down. And says, well, we're gonna we're gonna film the 400 attempt on Monday. Okay. Uh, already, my adrenaline is high, right? So the whole weekend, I rest. I I can mentally rehearse. I visualize. Mm -hmm. So I, normally, I train at 9 a.m. in the morning. So I figure, well, on Monday, I'm gonna be they're gonna be filming at nine. So I wake up. I take some ephedrine. I never take stimulant. I never take stimulant. <laughs> take some ephedrine, energy drink, caffeine pills. Yeah, because yeah, you're a two-way passionate. Like, you've got to look good. Yeah, you've got to get I the respect and admiration way, of right? others. I, I'm amped up out of my mind. <laughs> I mean, put some rave music on, babe. I'm swinging. So I, so I'm, 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 what I'm else also, did you take, Christian? Just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's a long Just kidding. list, right? I mean, I used to be, I, I wasn't too raving, so I had a few... <laughs> My you had lots of help lots of help yeah yeah so <laughs> i was my, my desk I, come over, I was shaking and moving like that oh my we're God. filming now we're filming now right? and oh they're not God. coming down say dude I'm, I'm i'm gonna fade i'm gonna fade i'm taking more ephedrine more caffeine some energy drink and, oh and what i didn't know was the energy drink had um bean in it now if you know your supplements you never combine um bean and ephedrine oh no because ephedrine is a uh, better adrenergic agonist. And you have been is an antagonist of the alpha receptors. Basically, taking ephedrine is like putting your, uh, the, 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 the gas pedal to the floor and binding you and being to the alpha receptors is cutting the brake line off. Oh, no. Yeah, not, not, I didn't know. Right? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. come on, let's lift, let's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you flew across the oh, room. We're lifting, we're lifting. All right, cool. So I'm warming up, dude. And oh after my that, God. I form upset. I, I feel my heart like getting squeezed. Wow. Like, dude, you're going to have a fucking heart attack. Yeah, yeah. I didn't feel good at all. Between sets, I had to take <laughs> deep breaths, calm oh my myself God. down. They were wondering what happened because normally I train super fast. I ended like 40 sets in 30 minutes. And I was taking five minutes between sets. Deep breaths, deep breaths. No, I know what? I actually hit the four plates. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came home, called my wife. I said, dude, honey, I high pull four plates aside. She had no idea what a high pull was, right? So she mm -hmm. was like super impressed. I said, but I might actually die tonight. And I meant it. I felt like I might wow. have a heart attack that night. Damn. But when you read the article on the right. internet, when you see the video, wow, a fucking wow. 400 pounds high pull, that's awesome. Right. Dude, I almost died to get a right. high pull. Felt like crap for four wow. weeks. All I did was high pull wow. two times a day. Thank you for sharing that. Cause that's what I love about you. You're super, super transparent. You're you, you'll tell the stuff that people aren't telling behind the scenes. I've always loved that about you. I mean, you, I mean, you have like, even your certification, you're like getting real personal about, yep, the, here's all my shit because I'm a two way and this is what the stuff it can lead to. And I love that. On the certification, one, one story that didn't make it was how a baseball game allowed me to conceive my first child. 
<laughs> it didn't make it into the story that got censored out. <laughs> it, it, it's not like in my normal seminars, but you know, <laughs> and, and that's something that nobody will never tell you uh, because of excess stress and dieting and stuff like that. I had uh, erectile dysfunction. It was really hard for me to get, but I had zero libido, zero. Okay. Mm. So, and because I'm high adrenaline, as soon as I get adrenaline, I respond super strongly to it. What, what right. does adrenaline does? It reduces peripheral blood flow, mm. which means right. there's no blood going down there because when you're fighting a tiger, right. you don't need to have that big, strong not- reaction unless you want to use <laughs> it as a weapon, right? Right. It was not my case. So I mm. always need to, be, and, and then I would just be, so my wife would come in and she's really into it, but I'm super stressed out because I'm right. not, well, I'd be able to, so it, it, it never happened. And then like 30 minutes later, I would be watching Seinfeld, for example, and boom, here it is. But right. now she's frustrated and she's downstairs. So anyway. Oh, so, good, good insight for so people, you know. Actually, well, it's because, of, anyway. so I was watching the Blue Jays baseball game and I have like this, I mean, new baseball bat appear not on the screen if you know what i mean right so <laughs> jen it's time it's because now it was even worse because she wanted to have a kid so now i had the pressure because if it's not because she was measuring her ovulation and stuff like that. so if right. it's not today we have to wait a month and then she's like giving me the stinky eyes for three weeks right oh my gosh now it's now so why are we getting aroused when you're watching like guys playing baseball in tight pants? <laughs> you're like, cause I'm relaxed. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That's because you're relaxed. And from that day on, never had any problem because I figured out oh, it's because I need to be relaxed anyway. And that's why my, my son is named Jay, Blue Jays. Oh, really? Oh my no, God. Not really. <laughs> this is amazing this is i love this about you christian thank you so much we will go ahead and wrap it up guys listen so christian's website it's still tibarmy.com right so t-h-i-b how do you actually say your last name because i know i say it wrong it is tibido okay i've got it okay cool i'm good so yeah so tibarmy.com and then on instagram now you're christian underscore tibido underscore tibarmy or something just 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 type in tibarmy yeah and you'll find all his stuff and you've i mean you've written for t nation for so long he has tons of good articles if you want to deep dive if you're keto and interested in that aspect he has a bunch of great articles he's written about that he's an amazing writer super fun to read your content you have an article called your brain on keto your brain on keto yeah yep it's so good and then if you want to take the neurotyping test, you can just go to his website. Um, I believe you have to like make an account just heads up on that and you can do that. Or I use it with all of my clients. So I appreciate you coming because my clients have always, they're so interested in it. Most of them are one B's and three. So you can imagine they want to geek out harder. He also has a whole series on YouTube talking about the different neurotypes overview is how they respond to training, how they respond to nutrition, you know, some other things there. So you have tons of resources online. Any, anything that you would like to direct people to what that you have coming up or, you know, what, how do people partake of what you got? Uh, what do you- that's pretty much it. First of all, because I'm the worst salesman in the history of mankind. I really don't like to talk about what I'm producing, but no, that, that's pretty much it. If you go to the social media and website, you're going to be updated on uh, everything, every, every new stuff coming up. Yeah. And if you guys, he has programs based on the neurotypes and they're really thorough. I've, I've bought like all of them and they have supplement protocols that can help you with your neurotype, the way he approaches nutrition and training and all that. So check that out as well. And yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Christian, thank you. So good talking to you again.